Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to First Parish in Concord. My name is Peter Lowett. I'm going to be uh, just sort of walking you through the agenda for this evening. Closer to the mic. Thank you. I will be closer to the mic. Uh, the agenda for this evening will be an introduction from Reverend Howard Dana of First Parish. Then we're going to go to a brief video of Greta Thunberg sort of talking about the immediacy of action around climate change. And then Congresswoman Trahan will be speaking about the Green New Deal, which she is a co-sponsor of. And I want to really uh, welcome her here and say how excited we are to have her. She'll uh, take some questions and answers after. And then uh, she has a very busy schedule, so she's going to break for her next uh, meeting. And at that point, we're going to have another video of uh, Alexandria Octavia Cortez sort of talking about the, the Green New Deal uh, and explaining a little bit more. And while that's happening, we're going to be joined on stage by a panel of students from our area high schools. So we have we have folks from Acton Boxborough, Concord Carlisle, Concord Academy, and Middlesex Academy here to share their thoughts with you about the Green New Deal and the immediacy of action around climate change. They'll speak for about 15, 20 minutes and take some questions, and then we'll invite you downstairs to a reception. So I'm going to bring up Reverend Howard Dana. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you here on a rainy Friday night at First Parish in Concord. I want to welcome you to this event and welcome you to our congregation. This uh, church was founded almost 400 years ago on this very spot. It had been a spot uh, long populated by Native American folks, and then um, our folks came along and they, co they coexisted somewhat in Concord uh, for those first few years. We uh, are glad to be part of the Unitarian Universalist Association, a very progressive uh, denomination which is active in a whole variety of uh, progressive causes, not the least of which is uh, care for our environment. I'm really pleased that you're here. Congresswoman Trahan, welcome. We are just so glad that you've made some time uh, this evening. And I have the pleasure of reading a wonderful little bio that her office put together. So here's just a little bit uh, about our Congresswoman. Lori Trahan was born and raised in a working class family in Lowell, Massachusetts. Her father was a, a, a union iron worker and her mother a domestic worker who juggled various part-time jobs while raising four girls. The first in her family to graduate from college, Lori earned a scholarship to play Division I volleyball at Georgetown University. She joined the staff of former Congressman Marty Meehan as a scheduler, eventually working her way up to Chief of Staff. Following her public service, Lori began working in the private sector as the only female executive at a tech company before moving on to co-found a woman-owned and operated consulting firm, Concierge, where she advised various companies on business strategy, how to create conditions for employees, especially women, to thrive. She and her husband, Dave, currently reside in Westford, Massachusetts, and are raising two young girls, Grace and Caroline, while keeping tabs on their three grown stepsons, Thomas, Dean, and Christian. As a member of the House Education and Labor and the House Armed Services Committee, committees, Lori is focused on fighting for working families on issues such as affordable health care, quality public education, workforce development, the environment, and working to end the pain and suffering of the opioid crisis. 
Lori is the first Portuguese American woman elected to Congress and is a member of the New Dems and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Welcome, we are so glad that you're here tonight. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of climate justice now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. Well, that is a tough act to follow. I'll be the first to admit. But I guess I will uh, deliver the message on behalf of the entire freshman class that I was privileged to join, that we are not going to ignore the people. Uh, in fact, we are very much focused on legislation that is for the people. And I'm happy to report, and thank you for delivering that, uh, that wonderful bio. I keep telling my, my office to shorten it by an order of magnitude, and it never seems to happen. Um, I didn't have myself running for office. Uh, I was compelled, just like so many of you, to get off the sidelines in 2016. Uh, and I'm happy that I did, because the entire time during 2017 and during 2018, I was always happy, uh, or I guess I took comfort in the fact that as things were getting worse, and sometimes it was hard to believe that they could get worse, 
that I was at least on a path where I could do something and that I was joined by so many people. And so I just want to thank you all because we would have never won this majority in 2018 and had some semblance of accountability and oversight uh, had it not been for so many people getting off the sidelines, so many young people uh, engaging in our political system. So uh, I should be thanking you, uh, and this is the way the gratitude flows. Um, I want to thank you for having me here tonight. I'm delighted. I'm actually wrapping up a two-week district work period. There's nothing like being home. It actually feeds my soul, and I don't just mean being home with my two little girls by the nine, uh, Caroline and Grace. It's, uh, it's just nice to be back amongst the people that uh, I'm so privileged to serve in this third congressional district. But it's also an honor to be here at the end of Earth Week, uh, just a short drive or a bike ride, I, I guess, from the Walden Pond, the birthplace of America's conservation movement. It was Henry David Thoreau who said, the price of anything is the amount of life you exchange for it. And for too long, we have all, we have traded away the safety and well-being of all of our future generations for our own comforts, just as, I didn't do the math, and I'm horrible at public math, but somebody tell me her age. <laughs> just 15, thank you, just as the 15-year-old in the video said. There is no greater threat to life on Earth than the growing climate catastrophe. And only immediate action, public engagement, and federal legislation will prevent worst case scenarios from emerging. Even more frequent mega storms, devastating floods, and sea level rise, and the humanitarian crisis of climate refugees. We've only really begun to get a glimpse of how incredibly dangerous climate change is and will yet become. The past five years have been the hottest on record. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the greatest it's been in three million years. In 2017, major storms, wildfires, and other climate-related disasters cost the United States over $300 billion, the most expensive year for disasters in our history. Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria were absolutely devastating. Harvey's more than 60 inches of rain broke the record for rainfall in all of the lower 48 states. It dumped over 1 trillion gallons of water on the area around Houston. Maria was the worst natural disaster in Puerto Rico's history, taking the lives of nearly 3,000 people. We need to address the climate crisis right now. There is no time for us to wait. Years of denial and delay from Washington require that we take the steps to invest in renewables and battery technology, get off fossil fuels without delay, and take adaptive measures to reduce the level of harm that is already in inevitable. The Green New Deal lays out an ambitious agenda for the United States to make the transition to clean renewable energy within 10 years. I'm proud to work with Senator Ed Markey and Representative Ocasio-Cortez, or AOC, as we'll come to call her. I'm proud to work with both of them to bring this issue to the forefront, and I'm pleased to be an original, original co-sponsor of the resolution. It has massively raised awareness. We're actually talking about the environment again. You can take credit for that. But we still must do so much more. Concord is well ahead of the game. Your select board passed a resolution earlier this year acknowledging the threat of climate change and endorsing the Green New Deal. Thank you. But we must continue the education process at the same time as we take every possible step to move toward clean energy. Polling shows a large majority of Americans believe in global warming. However, when the question is asked whether humans are causing the change in climate, the polls show much less agreement, particularly in places where fossil fuels are produced. <laughs> That's part of the reason why I'm one of the few members of Congress who refuses to accept corporate PAC money. We can't... We, we can no longer let special interests muddy the debate. And for far too long, big energy companies have left a trail of confusion and doubt around climate change. Attorney General Maura Healey has done outstanding work forcing Exxon to turn over documents and reveal its part in feeding the climate change skepticism.
It's been particularly inspiring to see so many young people across the nation organize to defend their futures and the planet's. The Sunrise Movement started in 2017 with just eight members, all under the age of 26. But since then, they have created 200 chapters across the country, including in our state with hubs in Lowell, Northampton, Salem, Boston, and the Vineyard. There are over 90 co-sponsors of the House Green New Deal resolution. That level of support on such an ambitious proposal is a direct result of the engagement of you, of our young people, and we need you to stay involved and hold this Congress accountable. The youth climate lawsuit has also been a powerful demonstration of how young people can make a difference. In 2015, 21 young people ranging in age from 12 to 21 filed suit against the United States, Juliana versus the United States, dem demanding their right to a clean environment and force action to get off fossil fuels. They've put together 50 years of evidence, 36,000 pages to be exact, to be used in court demonstrating the high, that the highest levels of government knew that burning fossil fuels was an enormous threat. Now I'll give you a trivia question. Who said this? This generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. Linda Johnson. I love Concord. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was Lyndon Baines Johnson, and it was in 1965. Young people, by demanding change, by demanding a Green New Deal, have restarted a debate in Congress that has been mostly dormant for the last few decades. We've already had more than a dozen hearings this year on climate change, after the issue was essentially ignored the last two years. In fact, among the first vote I took was to establish the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which is chaired by Kathy Castor from Florida. Kathy's district includes most of Tampa, one of the most vulnerable cities in the nation to the threat of sea level rise. So she understands personally the stakes involved. Next week, the House will take up Kathy's bill that I co-sponsor requiring the United States to remain in the Paris Climate Accord and meet our carbon reduction responsibilities. In 2015, under the Obama administration, we made a commitment to meet the target of a 28% reduction in carbon pollution below 2005 levels by the year 2025. We must stick to this agreement. If our word is to mean something, and if we are to demonstrate that the American people, if not the executive branch, takes this seriously, then we have to stick to it. One of the things that has impressed me most is the determination of the American people to continue with our commitment to the Paris Agreement in the face of an, of an administration that just wants out. The We Are Still In movement, anybody in that one? <laughs> is composed of hundreds of public and private institutions, schools and governments, faith organizations and tribes. Acton, Boston, and Lowell are all in it. Mass Bay Community College, MIT, and UMass Lowell are all in it. And the Unitarian Universalist Association is in it. So thank you. But let's be clear. This is a challenge on the order of the Apollo program, perhaps even greater. Currently, the United States emits about 6.5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide on a per person basis. We are responsible for more than 16 metric tons each year. We do not have the luxury of time to lower the rates incrementally. The situation demands aggressive action and the Green New Deal is a blueprint. It begins with tackling the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Electrical generation and transportation each account for about 30% of our emissions. Last year, the United States consumed more energy than ever before and 80% of it came from fossil fuels. Petroleum and coal, two of the dirtiest fuel sources, represent half of our total. While coal is a relatively tiny portion of our fuel mix in New England, across the nation, coal remains a popular fuel of choice. It produces more electricity than all renewables combined. 
Not only does coal emit more greenhouse gases than any other fuel source, it is polluting our air and water and our bodies with mercury. Coal-fired power plants are the most significant source of mercury pollution, emitting almost three quarters of all mercury air emissions in the United States. Clean air standards written by the Obama administration, standards that are under attack by our current administration, prevent up to 11,000 premature deaths, 5,000 heart attacks, and 130,000 asthma attacks each year. So not only must we get off coal to prevent carbon emissions, but to protect the lives of our vulnerable populations, particularly the very young and the elderly, those who are most threatened by toxic emissions. We have alternatives to fossil fuel-fired power plants, but we must scale up rapidly. In New England, we are showing the rest of the nation the way forward. Over the past 20 years, our carbon, our carbon dioxide emissions from electrical generation are down by 34%. Our savings have been equal to taking more than 13 million passenger vehicles off the road for a year. And we're seeing more and more renewables come online to reduce demand for fossil fuels. America's growing offshore wind industry is projected to, to generate 20,000 megawatts of clean, cost-effective power in seven states on the Atlantic seaboard by 2030. For context, one megawatt is generally estimated to be able to power 100 homes. Today, there are over 50,000 wind turbines generating over 90,000 megawatts in the United States. It's the largest renewable energy source in the nation. In Massachusetts, contracts have been signed for 800 megawatts to, uh, for offshore wind to come online over the next five years, and another 800 megawatts are planned by 2027. This means hundreds of more homes will be lit by clean power. We must also continue to push forward with solar. Today, the nation has almost 60,000 megawatts of, ins of installed solar capacity. Our state is in the top 10, ahead of even Florida, despite the fact that on average the Sunshine State gets more than 500 hours of sunlight than we do each year. That's three weeks. And thanks to solar, last Thanksgiving for the first time, demand on the electrical grid did not peak early in the day when everybody began turning on their ovens. Ordinarily, these moments are when the electrical grid reliably must draw from older, dirtier power sources to meet demand. But instead, solar kept demands on the grid manageable while we roasted our turkeys. That's progress. The third congressional district is in the top 10 percentile of all districts in the nation for installed solar. With more than 60,000 homes powered by solar and more than 50 companies involved in the industry, including some based right here in Concord, MJ Bradley and Associates and CPG Advisors. Solar has become more affordable. In recent years, it's about 80% cheaper today than just a decade ago. In fact, the International Renewable Energy Agency predicts that solar will outcompete fossil fuels on a cost basis in most parts of the world soon, perhaps in the next two years. We need to continue to show the nation the way forward by pushing forward with all the expansion of renewable energy as well as making improvements to energy efficiency. For the eighth year in a row, the Commonwealth was named first in the nation for energy efficiency. I'm particularly interested in ensuring that we provide the assistance necessary for those least able to make efficiency improvements to their homes. The Federal Weatherization Assistance Program has supported energy efficiency improvements to more than 7.4 million homes across the nation. And for every dollar invested in it, it produces $4.50 in benefits, including energy savings, as well as to our health and safety. Over the past decade, the Weatherization Assistance Program has weatherized more than 9,000 homes in Massachusetts. These are targeted to low-income families, and on average, they save hundreds of dollars each year. Despite the program's success, the administration's budget request has proposed to eliminate it, as well as its sister program, known as the State Energy Program. The Commonwealth has used these state energy programs to support energy storage technology. 
Energy storage is cr crucial to getting off of fossil fuels. It will allow the collected solar and wind energy to be stored for when the sun isn't shining and the wind doesn't blow. We in the House will reject these kinds of senseless cuts. We will push for full funding of weatherization and state energy programs, as well as support the scientists working in our national lab and at our universities to discover the breakthroughs necessary to end our reliance on fossil fuels. The Green New Deal also points the way for a transformation of our transportation sector. While we've actually seen carbon emissions decline in recent years from the electrical generation sector, the trend is in the wrong direction for transportation. Cars and trucks emitted nearly 400 million more metric tons of carbon dioxide in 2017 than in 1991. With the poor state of public transit, it's no surprise why people are more willing to suffer in traffic congestion than take a gamble on the train or bus. One area in which the White House and Congress may be able to strike a deal this year is on an infrastructure package, a green infrastructure package. <laughs> Investments in our roads and bridges will be a big part of it. There is at least an $800 billion backlog of needed highway and bridge improvements. But I've learned a fair amount about carbon eating concrete, <laughs> And we are committed to finding green technologies to go alongside with our gray infrastructure investments. I recently held an infrastructure tour throughout the third congressional district, and I can tell you there are enormous needs, well beyond bridges and roads, combined sewerage overflow, stormwater storm runoff, PFAS around the old Fort Devens, public transit. There are more than 54,000 bridges across the nation that are rated structurally deficient. Yet they're passed over 178 million times each day. In the Commonwealth, we have 481. Nearly one in 10 bridges are structurally deficient. Five minutes from here is the Elm Street Bridge over the Sudbury River, which was built just 20 years after Thoreau published Walden. <laughs> and then it was reconstructed again in the early 1930s. But there is also the Route 2 Concord Turnpike. Bridge, uh, the Concord Turnpike Bridge that's over the river, also built in the 30s. Both of these need work. So we absolutely must up invest in the upkeep of our roads and our bridges, but that isn't enough. To reduce emissions from the transportation sector, we have to invest in public transit and multimodal transportation options. People will make the choice of public transit if they can trust that it will be reliable, convenient, safe, and affordable. But if those four factors aren't present, and if a personal vehicle is available, that's the choice that will be made. There is at least $90 billion needed to bring the nation's public transportation just up to a state of good repair. Earlier this year, we passed a budget that provides nearly $700 million for rail infrastructure and nearly $2 billion for Amtrak. Those kinds of investments and many more will need to be part of this infrastructure package. They make public transit more viable and they reduce our carbon emissions. We also need to make multimodal transit more viable from car to bus or bike to train and vice versa. The Commonwealth has made real strides in the area of becoming more bicycle friendly. We rank 12th in the nation in bike commuting, and we've had one of the greatest increases in bike commuters in the nation over the past decade. We have incredible local assets, like the Assabet River Rail Trail, the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, and the Bay Circuit Trail. Not only are these kinds of projects good for our bodies and for our spirits, but also for our environment. Today, nearly one in five traffic-related fatalities, however, are pedestrians or bicyclists. As long as bike trails and bike lanes aren't adequately respected by or even separated from traffic, the risks of injury or worse will be too great for most people to consider making that an alternative. <laughs> and for a state as environmentally conscious as ours, we only have a dozen bicycle-friendly communities, according to the Massachusetts Bicycle Association and the League of American Bicyclists half as many as Colorado and Minnesota. 
See, we're used to being ranked one, so we've got some work to do. <laughs> Congress is providing some funding for pedestrian and bike projects, but we need to do more to provide the right support and incentives. I've signed on to legislation by my friend, Earl Blumenauer, which would extend commuter benefits to employees who choose to bike to work. But we also need to be sure that the infrastructure package includes support for dedicated bike lanes so that these kinds of projects are more feasible for more communities. Finally, and then we'll take questions, the fun part. The Green Deal, as you all know, is a statement of our principles, and it's a call to action. Unquestionably, it is very ambitious. But we must be ambitious to tackle the scale of danger of climate change and harvest the opportunities that will come from transitioning finally off of fossil fuels. The carbon that we have been pumping into the atmosphere for generations won't go away overnight. But with the will and the commitment of people like you who care deeply about this issue, we will make the changes that we must to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And I'll leave you with just one more quote from Thoreau. If one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. I am grateful to you for all your spirit of optimism. That is the way we deliver the Green New Deal and protect our planet for generations to come. So thank you for inviting me this evening and I look forward to your questions. Logistically, for questions, we just ask that you come up to the two microphones. So if you've got questions, just come on up to the microphones. Do I do it? Yeah. I, I, I'm not choosing. You, well, you uh, tell me. Start on one side and we'll alternate. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, my name is Leslie Griffinius, and I live in Westwood. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you if you could speak a little bit to the New Deal part of this Green New Deal. Yeah. Because part of, I think, the anxiety, but besides the climate change and the natural disasters that, that we're going to experience, is the job situation for young people. So if you could talk a little bit about what, what's envisioned, what the government can do. You bet. Be great. Thank you for the question. Because I think one of the things that was most compelling about the Green New Deal is that it had at the heart um, is attacking the income inequality gap, um, the gap that exists in opportunity for too many of our communities. You know, one thing that I observed and just couldn't actually believe about this administration in its first two years into the term was that we never looked at our investment in the environment as an economic driver. That we never looked at it as a way for us to fuel a new economy and put more people to work. And I think that is the aspiration of the Green New Deal. We see opportunity with not only protecting our environment for generations to come, but also creating jobs that, thank you. But also, uh, thank you, that's much better. <laughs> uh, but also giving more opportunities and creating more jobs for more people, which is something we so desperately uh, need. You know, I think one of the things that we're going to vote on, as I said, right when we get back from this recess, is HR 8, no, excuse me, HR 6, uh, which is going to be us, the Congress, basically using our Article 1 um, duties to get back into the Paris Climate Accord and to start um, complying with those carbon reduction uh, goals. We have, yeah, it, yeah. we, um, <clears throat> There are a number of proposals on the table to also figure out how to bring the aspiration of the Green New Deal, because it's a joint resolution, so it's a, uh, there, it is an actual legislation, how we're going to bring that into legislative form so that it can be marked up in a number of committees. So the Green New Deal actually has to go before many committees before it's turned into legislation and voted on the floor. And so I think you raise a good point. I think one of the reasons why the Green New Deal has so much momentum is because it tackles 
examples, uh, two existential threats, the income inequality gap that is just basically um, uh, uh, but just <laughs> it's it's not only not giving opportunity to too many people who are trying to cross that chasm, but it's keeping them down over generations. Those so many of that plays out uh, disproportionately more in this district, right? We represent communities like Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill and Gardner and Fitchburg, and there is a real need to get um, people above and sustainably above and not just the poverty line, but into working class and then into middle class. So I think one of the one of the byproducts of this new Congress, the fact that you know some of us uh, some of us came from working class backgrounds, some of us came from trailer homes, some of us came well some of us were just bartenders a couple of years ago, is this working class spirit and a and a and a real um, impetus to do our part to solve that problem as we're as we're tackling the existential threat that is climate change. Thank you. Hi, Peter Wallace from Concord. I'm really excited about the fact that you're interested in both climate change and inequality. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wonder how you feel about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which is a bipartisan legislation before Congress now would raise taxes on carbon emissions, yeah. but then give all the money back to the people, so most people actually would end up making money on that, while uh, we'd be sending the price signals to uh, actually uh, get more change. Yeah. No, I th thank you for the question. There have been a couple of pricing, uh, carbon price, carbon tax type proposals that have been introduced. Some have actually been reintroduced because they've had, ha they've had bipartisan support and others are coming out of the new Dems caucus, for example. So we're sort of looking at all of those right now. Uh, some of them are actually going through the select committee on, uh, on the environment so that we can mark those up and negotiate them into one package. So I'm excited to, um, to just sort of explore all those options. I do like the idea of, uh, of the carbon price, the carbon fee, everyone calls it something different. Um, and we're kind of looking at st structures that are a little bit, that takes the complexity out of it. Um, so I'm going to look at, uh, I'll look at the one that you, you know the HR number, don't you? What is the number? Not offhand. Sorry. Oh, okay, good. Because yeah. I thought I had to know the number and I'm only there for 100, I've only been there for 100 days so I don't have them all. Uh, sorry, I don't know them all yet. But I, we are going to look at all of those uh, as we sort of explore this, um, these next round of packages. Great. So thank well, the you. great thing about this is that the money comes back to people. Yes. And uh, it's actually an idea that comes from Republicans, so maybe we could actually pass it. <laughs> yeah. Your consideration. Yep. Nope. Thank you. We are, you have to get really scrappy uh, to find um, those opportunities to work with Republicans. So. We'll definitely check it out. All right, I'm over here. All right, uh, I'm Bob Lawson from here in Concord. Hi, Bob. Uh, I'm wondering what you. I want to run my strategy behind over, uh, across your 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 thinking brain here, and let me know what you think. You give me a we, lot of credit. We we have something we have something now we've never had before. We have got a we've got a presidential candidate. I'm sorry. Yeah, that might be that, me. No, that's me. Um, we've got a presidential candidate for the first time, who's making climate the number one issue in his campaign. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we jump on that? <laughs> Our friend Tom Tarpey over here had, him, uh, had Governor Jay Inslee at his house last month for a meet and greet. Oh. And, he, and, and Inslee's stunning. I mean, he was a congressman, he was a senator, now he's a governor, and he's been on board with this his entire career. Lots of great ideas, and he makes the excellent point that I think what the Republicans will do is they'll say a Green New Deal is going to work against the economy. And Inslee makes the point it's the exact opposite. Yep, the greatest right. economic boons that we've had have been revolved around chain, major changes in technology. Yep. And this is just the next stage in that. Yeah. So I don't see it as something that's going to hurt the economy. I see it as something that's going to give us a boom. And, and Inslee's doing this, and I just hope he hangs on. I mean, in the end, when somebody else is chosen and it's not him, then, then we get on board with that person. But shouldn't now everyone in this room be rooting for Inslee and doing everything we can to have him become more prominent? So I couldn't agree with you more on uh, making environment central to the platform. 
uh, and also talking about it in terms of our economy. Uh, I am going to not comment on who I think is going to win this presidential election for obvious reasons. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, given that global warming is a threat to all life on this planet, um, does the Green New Deal address, or would you be willing to sponsor or support legislation that would eliminate the $26 billion a year subsidy currently going to the fossil fuel industry and instead direct those funds toward renewable energy and sustainability projects? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think that, um, well, I, th I, I actually view that as a yes or no question, so I will say yes. Uh, I can't give you a preview into the likelihood of that happening in this Congress or the next Congress. Uh, I think that right now there's a lot of uh, committee chairmen who are thinking about short-term goals and long-term goals, and that's just because we've, we're operating in a, in a certain political context. Um, but I do know that in, you know, not a lot of people like incrementalism, and look, the Green New Deal is not incrementalism. We are getting ready uh, for, uh, you know, bold change and when we can achieve bold change. But I think along the way, tackling things like subsidies or through our tax policy or the incentives that we give fossil fuel companies through ways and means is something that we can do as we approach 2021, and there's my optimism. You're welcome. Um, thank you so much for coming and spe or speaking for us tonight. Um, I'm curious, what do you believe are the biggest challenges to achieving the goals of the Green New Deal? Um, and how do you think we can combat these challenges? Because as you said, this is a very yeah. ambitious policy. Yeah. Uh, the challenges right now is that we don't have collaborators in the Senate, or enough collaborators in the Senate. Uh, you know, you've heard what, what Leader McConnell has said about the fate of the Green New Deal. Uh, but you know, I'm, I don't let that get me down at all. You know, the 2018 was an important step for us uh, to show that our country is taking its reins back, right? People are uh, running on a bold, a bolder uh, initiative and basically a reprioritization on policy issues. And I think we have to stick to that. I mean, the single most important thing that we can do is start now in terms of mobilizing and organizing for whether it's, and everybody has a different flavor on how they want to engage, but whether it's flipping uh, the Senate and getting involved in those highly contested races, building um, the House majority, right? Like, so I have to be honest, I mean, the, the majority that we have right now in the House, it's a fragile majority. I mean, I sit with 44 freshman colleagues who won in red states, and they only, they won with less than 5% of the vote. So they already have challengers, there are already, they're already negative ads playing out against them. I mean, it is that tight. So we cannot afford to take our foot off the pedal for a second, right? And we saw what happens when people mobilize and people get off the sidelines in droves, not just to run, but also to help people get elected and to help people focus on the issues that matter and to help tell that person who was thinking like, oh, I'm just not gonna vote today. Like, no, you have to vote today. So I think it's really important that we all do our part to make sure that in 2020, we not only reelect this majority, build on that majority in the House, flip the Senate, and we get behind the right candidate, the Democratic candidate, uh, for the whoever, whomever he or she may be, uh, in the White House, because you know we we can't have another four years of this. I think we all understand that you know it's that would be uh, devastating. I, I just say we have to contain the stain, right? This is something we don't want to bleed into our history pages, right? And there is an incredible burden of history that is upon all of our shoulders. I feel it all the time, and I know you all do too. So I think the best thing that we do is we work together and we, we, we remain organized, we remain active, we make those phone calls, we knock on those doors, we travel the country if, if we're allowed to, to go to these swing districts and we, we do whatever necessary to, uh, to get our House, Senate, and White House back.
Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Liam O'Toole, and for the last two years, I've been a youth organizer with Justice Democrats. Thank you. Yes, uh, talk for that. And if anybody in this room knows anything about us, it's that we try our best to hold other Democrats accountable when they're not quite there yet on progressive issues like the Green New Deal. You say yourself, right now we only have 90 House co-sponsors. Uh, Is that right? Is it 90? Okay, I'm sorry. I was getting that mixed up with Medicare for All, which is 107. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, either way, though, I want to know how do you think can we go about holding other Democrats accountable in the House and in the Senate and at the federal level to kind of get on board with the Green New Deal and its provisions? Because yeah. I'm a realist right now. I know that right now we're not going to get anywhere on the Green New Deal. It's not that you're not going to get. It's not that we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, we can't say that. It's so grim. Uh, just the, the boldness of the idea and the aspiration has already done more than what we've achieved in the last couple of years, right? We, I'm going to take you back to February, like February 3rd or 5th, right? We were talking about border security. We were talking about the government shutdown. And then the Green New Deal came on, like just came on everyone's radar because of you, because of the Sunlight Movement, because of the Justice Democrats, because of people in this room. And in an instant, we were talking about the environment. Sure right? thing. I, I, I want to know primarily, since right now we do have a hostile Republican Congress, yeah. I want to know when we do usher in uh, Democrats back into power, how are we going to keep our own house in order to actually get those Democrats on board with the Green New Deal? I, you know, I think we're going to see some movement. We're going to see some trickle. <laughs> of the Green New Deal in this new select committee on the environment. I think you're going to see action on the environment. Like, there aren't that many select committees. Right? I think we have two today that are built just to deal with uh, matters of high priority that fall outside of our regular committee structure. So I think you're going to see things happen this year that are informed or influenced by the fact that we've got this Green New Deal. Now, it's not going to be by every Democrat, and I'll tell you why. There are some Democrats that are new Dems in the middle of the country that are having a hard time with co-sponsoring the Green New Deal, but they're not going to have a hard time with some of the policies that come out of the Green New Deal, that kind of come out of committee voting for those things, right? It's just, and it's just the reality that we're in, right? There's like, they, they won by 2%, it's that close. And so they're so in tune with their districts and what they're for and what they're against that right now it might be a little, so that we can build till later it being a lot, right? And we are, I mean, a lot is going to be 2021 at our nearest opportunity. And so I, I'm, I just man, I manage my own expectations that way because I'd go crazy with the impatience that I have going through my body if I didn't think about it in terms of like milestones like that, right? We're gonna achieve certain things in this Congress just because of our, you know, the political reality. And then, but we're gearing up for a moment where we can have much more progress uh, made. So that probably doesn't, I don't expect that answer to satisfy you because you're a young person and you're much more impatient than all of us. But I would just say stay at it. I mean, it's not just holding people accountable, it's educating people. There are a lot of people that don't actually understand the act of doing nothing, the consequence of us not taking on these types of uh, goals. And, you know, I. I would say keep it educating, you know, keep on social media, it's so effective. I can't believe how many people have come around because they have felt the momentum on social media that you all create. So you just gotta stay at it. I mean, the coolest thing about the last year is that young people who have, you know, in the past haven't been as mobilized, haven't been as engaged, you know, in an organized way, really made their voices heard. And it's not just on one issue like it has been over history. It's been on multiple issues. And so that is a generational force that no one in this Congress can ignore. So you have more power than you think. I think it's education, accountability, and, um, and just staying organized around this issue. Thank you. Hello, I have, um, I have a two-part question. It's very, very brief, so I don't want to scare you with that. And I'll be satisfied with the yes or no on either one if that's what you want to give. Okay. First part, 
is do you subscribe to the uh, Native American principle of seven generations? The seven generation principle, do you know what I'm talking about? No. Does everyone else know what that is? Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> My dad, Deb Holland, and like Sharice Davids would kill me right now. Okay. Well, I bet you know what it is, but you just, I'm just. I just don't know the title of I'm it. I'm just handcuffing you by throwing you curve in front of an audience. It's, it's, it's the, I, <laughs> but what I mean, I should say, because I put it in the question. Okay. Uh, the seven generation principle uh, stated simply, I understand it is to mean that any decision that's made right now that affects our welfare has to be considered in the life of how it affects people out the seven generations. Ah, okay, I like that principle. Uh, when when Ola LeDuc ran for vice president with mm -hmm. Ralph Nader, the day before the election, she was on radio, and uh, she was um, she was asked what her economics was, what the you know because she wasn't very visible on the platform, and she says my whole economic program, start to finish, A to Z, you know, A to Amen is a seventh generation rule. She's also a trained, I actually ran into her by accident in a coffee shop once and, <laughs> and, we, and got, to, got a chance to know her. Oh. And I asked her, well, what is her profession? And she said, this is a quote, I'm a trained economist from Harvard. That's her education and, and that's what her specialty is. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was pretty interesting. So we've gotten, we started a conversation about the seven generation rules and it, yield some pretty amazing results. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered if, I was wondering, I was gonna ask the follow up was, do you, does it factor in any way into your? It does uh, now. Okay, good. <laughs> don't, I, I won't pop up again. No, look, I don't mind. Look, it's, it's incredibly orienting. When you gave me the definition, I mean that is. Uh, uh, that's how I think we should all be thinking. You know, sometimes when you're in, Sometimes when you're in Congress, and sometimes one of the things that I have found that you know you've you've got these two-year terms, and it doesn't exactly incent you to have to do some long-term thinking. Seven generations. Yes, it's a rough. Uh, but you know it's that's just a mind shift, uh, and I think that you know there are but a lot of. But you're making the point, and rightly so. We have to start thinking that. We absolutely do. We have to. We absolutely do. Look, I think that's who we got, why you got so many moms this year. I'm one of 131 women serving in our Congress, our nation's most his, in history. And a lot, and I'd say, I think, I think part of the reason why so many women got off the sidelines is because we couldn't handle watching gun violence persist in our country. We couldn't handle watching us ignore the environment. We couldn't handle, uh, you know, having policies in the workplace that our kids, that we didn't want our kids entering into. I mean, those are all things that are, we're thinking well beyond our, ourselves here. We're thinking about generations to come. So, thank so you. We, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we've got time for one more uh, question for the Congresswoman. Yes. Hi, how are you? Richard Ford here. I know who you are. <laughs> this is not a plant, by the way. I have no idea what he's going to ask. We recognize that uh, the green economy will create millions of jobs, uh, but also there will be a rather major disruption. What do we do about the coal miner? the oil worker, yeah. and all those other people that don't necessarily have the skills to yeah. move into other high tech or other jobs in general. You bet. And I love the empathy of that question because uh, it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, sometimes when we have shifts in our economy, there's temporary, people who are temporary displaced become permanently displaced, and that is on us. I mean, that is, we can't let that happen. Um, look, one of the things that I'm most proud to be a part of is I secured a, a spot on the Education and Labor Committee. One of the reasons why I'm, I fought so hard to be on that committee is because I think we've got a lot of underutilized assets in our communities. Uh, we've got, um, we need a mindset shift and a re-engineering around how we think about education. Uh, it is lifelong learning, and a lot of times it's reskilling and retooling people for a different, uh, for different jobs. I mean, one of the things that I've been most frustrated with, I've got three stepsons. They're 25, 22, and 20, and um, 
you know, I've gone to a lot of college tours and a lot of college campuses, and even in my own lifetime, I've seen this American dream get too tightly tethered just to a college education. But when you grow up in a city like Lowell, when you go to a high school like Lowell High, you realize that not every kid is going to college, and, and that's okay. Uh, we've got to expose other lanes of education, practical lanes of education, to our young people so that they have economic opportunity, so they can get a good job and have a better life. And we have to do that across the board, not just for our young people, uh, not just with our vocational and our technical schools, but with apprenticeships and with community colleges, and basically, use those, like utilize those assets as though we were a company who thought of like our, our resources in three shifts, right? I mean, we've got, we've got this ability to use these shared resources in our community. And I'm talking about our, um, our community colleges, I'm talking about our, our uh, technical and vocational schools to help retrain people for the jobs that we actually attract and retain in our economy, in our local economy. Now that's going to be different. That's hard to do in a macro sort of way. Um, but you know, one thing the productive, um, the pro the productivity craving side of me comes home uh, and works with. New uh, Northern Essex Community College and the employers around there to get kids in Lawrence High School who maybe didn't go to the Greater Lawrence Vocational School to get them into programs, to design programs that actually get them a credential, 18 months, two years, and into a good paying job that we actually have. And you build a cluster around that. I mean, I think if you're, if you're really focused on economic development and you're really focused on improving the lives of the people in your community, you're willing to roll up your sleeves and you're willing to figure out how can we build clusters of industry here and use the resources that we have. We've got some fine public institutions. We've got UMass Lowell, I've got Fitchburg State in the West, Framingham State in the South, with lots of community college assets, apprenticeship programs, and, um, and technical schools to go along with that. And I think every district has to get really in tune to what they're going to lose and how they're going to not just temporarily fill that gap, but in a very long-term way. So you know, the transition off of fossil fuels, it's not going to happen overnight. So the, we've got the luxury to plan this. Uh, but I think if we, if we do it, and we do it on committees like education and labor, we can get in front of that. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. You all join me in. Uh, Someone's thanking. waving back there. Uh, I, I don't know. I I, I you, can't. You, I made eye contact. I can't be the bad guy. <laughs> I can't hear. Uh, I think we're done with questions. I'm sorry. It was my fault. It wasn't hers. I did. I called. I, <laughs> I was going to suggest that those coal workers in the coal industry where they do that mountaintop mining, uh -huh. instead they put up solar panels <laughs> where there's no longer any trees. The sun shines right down on it and makes some renewable solar energy. Okay, hey, here we go. That's great. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, can we just have one more round of applause Thank you. for the choir? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm standing for you. I just, and then my standing over. back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So be, before we go to the uh, video, I am, I am remiss because I did not introduce uh, the Climate Solution Speaker Series and the, their co-sponsors. This Sunrise Town Hall and presentation on the Green New Deal is the 16th event that the Speaker Series has done since it formed in 2015. It's a consortium of 10 Concord-based organizations who all share a deep concern about climate change and who want to be part of solving this problem and building a better future together. These organizations are Concord Climate Action Network, the Concord Carlisle High School and Concord Public Schools, the League of Women Voters of Concord and Carlisle, Mothers Out Front, Musketaquid Arts and Environment, 
and the social action groups at four local churches, First Parish in Concord here, the Trinitarian Congregational Church, Trinity Episcopal Church, and the West Concord Union Church. So uh, we'll, yeah. Oh, do you want to bring them up? Yeah. Oh, we're good. you want to watch the video now? Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. 
Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Um, my name is Audrey Lynn. I attend Concord Academy. Hi, I'm Anna Sander. I'm a junior at Concord Academy. I'm Alex Flynn from Middlesex School. Hi, I'm Kevin Liu at Acton Boxborough. Hi, I'm Isabella from Middlesex School. Hi, I'm Sargum and I'm from Acton Boxborough. Great. Can we? Uh... Why don't you start by explaining the, why, how you got involved in the Sunrise Movement? Yeah, so first I just want to thank all of you guys for coming out tonight. I know it's kind of gross outside, um, but I'm really excited that you're all here, um, ready to hear about the Green New Deal. So my name is Audrey, um, I am 17 years old, and I've been involved in Sunrise Movement since about last June. Um, and I am engaging with climate action because I'm genuinely afraid for my future and what happens if we do not take action to fight this crisis. Um, the climate crisis is intersectional. It impacts Americans and people all over the world at varying degrees. Climate change is hurting people and it is hurting people right now. Um, and we really need to take action to stop it. Um, so Sunrise is a national movement of young people fighting to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. 
As Congresswoman Johan mentioned earlier, it was founded in 2017 by young people. Um, and since then, it has grown tremendously. Uh, but when I got involved with it, it was still relatively small. There were only about 20 hubs um, nationwide. Um, I'm plugged into the one in Boston. Um, and now I'm really excited to say that there are over 200 groups organizing under the name of Sunrise, which is very exciting. Um, so Sunrise has 11 key principles, and I would like to just share uh, one of them with you. Um, the key principles are really guiding in how hub structure works, um, and then this is just one principle that I think is especially important to solving the climate crisis and coming together and organizing in communities. This is principle number five. We tell our stories and we honor each other's stories. We all have something to lose to climate change and something to gain in coming together. We tell our individual stories to connect with each other and understand the many different ways this crisis impacts us. Um, so I think that that's pretty important. Um, and as I said, Sunrise has been going for a little bit now. Um, over, I have worked on campaigns with, uh, I have worked with Sunrise to get politicians to sign things like the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Um, I was pretty involved in the midterms. Sunrise endorsed candidates that were ready to stand up and fight for climate action. Um, but it really started to grow um, at its first, in, back in November of 2018, they had a really big action at Nancy Pelosi's office, which started to uh, gain Sunrise's national attention. A month later, I joined Sunrise along with a thousand other young people at Actions in DC. And this really started to um, change the narrative on climate change. As Congresswoman Trahan was talking about, the Green New Deal wasn't on the map six months ago. Nobody was talking about climate change six months ago. Nobody in um, Congress was talking about climate change seriously six months ago. Um, and now I'm really excited that we have leaders like AOC who are ready to stand up and fight for our generation to the scale um, that this crisis demands. Um, so I'm really, really excited to be sitting here with um, fellow young people, young adults who are standing up for their future. Um, so I think it's important to emphasize that Sunrise is a movement led by young people, focused around the voices of young people. Um, because we are the generation that has the most to lose. The decisions and policies that are made now will determine if my generation will have access to a safe and livable future. So that's a little bit about Sunrise. I'm happy to take questions about that later, if you have specific ones. Um, and I think uh, we're going to open up the panel. Before, before we move on, uh, I understand there's an Acton Boxborough connection with Sunrise. One of the students like to address that? Yeah, so Sunrise, uh, Sunrise's um, executive director, Varshini Prakash, um, she helped found Sunrise in 2017, uh, graduated from Acton Boxborough in 2011, I want to say. Yeah, 2011. <laughs> Okay, so the, the students have generated a number of questions uh, that uh, they've asked me to ask them. So what aspect of the Green New Deal are you most excited about? Um, so for me, I'm really excited about the Green New Deal because I believe it doesn't just address the climate change, sorry, the climate action that we need to happen, but it also does so in a way that it prioritizes um, frontline communities, communities that have been historically oppressed um, in a way that I think is really important. Um, the people who are going to lose the most from climate change are the people who have contributed the least to climate change. Um, and the Green New Deal does a lot in terms of creating jobs in these communities that are gonna be really impacted. Um, it does a lot in low-income low places, um, places that where there's coal miners, I know that question came up earlier, where there's been um, a lot of fossil fuel jobs, turning those into solar and renewable jobs. Um, yeah, I'm really excited that it does more than just climate action and also addresses a lot of other issues that I think are really pressing in this country. Um, I am personally very excited about the fact that there's a part in the Green New Deal that has, creates jobs for um, people. And I like that because it answers to the economic critics of the Green New Deal. And I feel that um, uh, um, that like I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, ladies and 
Uh, another, another question, what elements seem the most critical to you? Anyone want to take a shot at that? Um, I think some of the elements that are really critical are uh, that this is, as Anna said, prioritizing frontline communities. This is an economic transformation, a, econo a huge economic transition for the United States, and this is something that will not leave people behind. This is going to bring, this is going to bring equity across um, communities of color in low-income areas. Um, it's really going to be working on um, building up communities that have been historically disenfranchised, historically um, ignored by the government. Um, and I think that that is really, really critical. Because if we're going to talk about taking action related to environment, we can't ignore the intersections between environmental justice and social justice. Um, also, just adding to that, I think it's really exciting that the Green New Deal is making a really big change now because we have so little time to change our climate action right now so that we only raise up to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, so I think it's so exciting that it's taking action now and it's making such a big change that it's not just waiting for other people to tell us that it's okay. We're actually pushing it forward and making sure that it happens because it's change that needs to happen right now. All right, um, another question. Uh, what do you bring to this movement as young people? Um, I think the fact that we're going, that we're living through um, climate change and we're gonna be the generation who's actually going to um, live through all the change that is occurring is um, really central to our role in um, shaping future legislation and all of that. Um, so the fact that we're going to be like directly impacted um, in the future, I think will really play a role in that. Um, I think people always talk about how like, oh, the grandchildren in the future are gonna be impacted by climate change, but we are the grandchildren that are going to be experiencing that. And I think because of that, um, as young people, we really bring a sense of urgency that a lot of other people don't. We bring a sense of the policies that are implemented right now are gonna be the policies that determine the rest of our lives. And I think, at least for me, I'm really terrified by a lot of, um, by the idea that my future is not gonna be anything that I expected it, that, um, that the, my friends, that the people that are up on the stage, that we're going to have um, really challenging and really um, potentially not great living, um, living experiences in the future. Um, and I think also another thing um, that we have as young people is we have the power of social media, which I feel like um, is really important in how we're um, building this movement. Um, I know Audrey runs the Sunrise Movement social media for Boston, um, and it's been a huge way that Sunrise has been able to uh, build momentum all across the country um, that's uniting us, that's bringing us together and pushing this forward. And I think also a major part is that, like, as young people, like, when we protest or do anything, like, people generally tend to listen. And I think that, you know, a lot of times young people, you might think they're kind of apathetic or, you know, they don't get out to vote as much. And I think that's something we really need to change because when we do vote or when we do go out and protest, like with the Sunrise Movement, it's really effective. And then people start listening and then we can actually get some change done. And definitely to speak to uh, the effectiveness of the protests, especially those that go on during, say, school hours or during work hours. The idea is that there's no point in studying or learning or spending time in a situation to plan for a future that we don't have, that we may not have if we don't take action and have these protests and speak out. So there's really that the social media aspect of it can help unite kids in the fact that we need to kind of all be together and as one on this. You guys sound very, very motivated. Uh, what, what drives you to take on this climate crisis fight? Yeah, so um, 
I personally, uh, from a very young age, have been involved in the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts of America. So I've spent the majority of my childhood outside hiking, canoeing, and when I got into um, middle school and high school, started taking environmental science courses, I've begun to realize that my, my kids, my grandkids, will not have the opportunities that I have and that I had to enjoy this, this wonderful nature that we have. And that, that really struck me, that I could be one of the last ones to even experience this for, for myself. So I definitely took up that idea as something that, hey, maybe I'm just one person, but I can contribute something to changing this. I think I'm really motivated by the belief of, if not me, then who? Um, I can look at this crisis and I see so many things that are going on and so many things that I want to change. Um, and I'm really trying to be the change that I want to see. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I do sincerely believe that if I'm not part of this solution, if I am not actively fighting for a better future and fighting the climate crisis, then I am I'm complacent with the problem and I am part of that problem. Um, and so that's really what motivates me to be involved with organizations like Sunrise and spend time organizing with them. Hey, uh, why do you think the youth vote will turn out in 2020? We're really motivated to turn out because it's something that's affecting our future right now. And for, for the first time, for a lot of us, it'll be our first time getting to vote and to really have an impact on something like directly because you can go out and protest and then also being able to actually vote for it is a really big impact in realizing that that's so powerful and that's something that a lot of people don't recognize the power in. Because we live in an age where climate change is going to affect us so dramatically, that's kind of putting out to people that there's more of a pressure to vote and to get your voice heard because you need to voice your opinions while you still can and while you have the opportunity to change the world for the better. And, and through that, uh, we, we're beginning to see some, some more opportunities to vote coming around as young people encourage uh, their friends and our friends to pre-register to vote, to head out to, to voting centers and help people who maybe don't know where to start spread the word around, again, back to the social media aspect of it. The fact that we can influence our own um, generation to get out to the ballot box, especially with the awareness coming with the grades, um, basically from, from our age, maybe three years down, three years up, this is the, the group of people that are beginning to take up this mantle and will vote in 2020, 2024, and start to make these changes. I'd just like to add on that in the past few years, um, these new facts about climate change and the consequences of climate change have come out by scientists. And uh, when we read these facts, we were really scared about our future. And the sensible thing that I feel for the government to do would be to uh, stop the activities that con contributed to climate change. And that didn't happen. And I feel that young people, and I'm sure many of you felt frustrated about that. And I feel that um, our young generation that is coming to the age to vote will translate their frustrations to the voting platform. I think that we're motivated um, based on two main things. I think one, we're angry at the way that politicians have stolen our future. I think we're angry at the way that um, the system feels like it's robbed us of us and of our children, um, of our peers, of the chance to have the future that we wanted to have. And I think also we're motivated by hope that we have solutions, we have renewables, um, we have <laughs> these ways that we can change um, we can transform the economy, we can transform the country, we can transform the world. We can have this future if we work together, if we turn out of the ballot box, um, elect politicians that we feel like um, will make this difference and advocate on, on our behalf. Um, so I'd say that those two things are gonna drive the youth turnout.
Uh, so this is a question that I'd like an answer to. Uh, how do you transcend politics and get more people on board? I think we're all looking for that answer, right? <laughs> transcend politics, get more people on board with climate change. Teachers, please. <laughs> Um, I think education is a big aspect of that. Um, a lot of people in this country um, and in the world in general aren't, um, they may feel some of the effects of climate change but don't really know how widespread it is and how critical it is um, today. And so I think um, all of us have had the benefit of great educations um, concerning that. And so um, making sure that there's more equitable education, um, especially um, in science would be um, a great thing in order to make, um, in order to transcend politics and make sure everyone is aware of um, how critical um, climate change is. Um, I think first of all, I think it's really unfortunate that climate change is a political issue um, where something that is factual is turned into a belief system. Um, I'm really disappointed in that, but I can't really change that. Um, and I think what's really going to transcend that political barrier between, um, I think, Democrats and Republicans is really that this is an issue that is affecting everybody. This isn't just affecting one demographic. This is affecting all people in the United States. Um, and I think more and more people are starting to come to terms with that as their homes are destroyed, as their communities are burned down, um, and really realizing that we need to take action on this. I think that also this issue, I feel like it's something because it affects so many people and it affects all of us across party lines, it's something that we have the potential to invite others into and not make it just a democratic issue because the political system right now is so polarized that it feels like people on the other side can't talk to each other. And I feel like climate change, because it's an issue that will affect all of us, we can invite those people in. So take a moderate who doesn't necessarily know how they feel about climate change and say, okay, here's what's happening, here's what's going to happen in the future, why don't you join us and find out how to stop it? And so through that, I feel like it's a very powerful tool for uniting the country in a time that's very divided. And speaking back to the point of what young people can do about this, we're all going to have to face that. And so uniting against this common goal and kind of putting behind ourselves the division of party politics and just focusing on we're all human, we're all going to go through the same terrible circumstance if we don't do something about it now, so let's take action for it, is a really important idea that's going to bring us together. I think uh, another important perspective on this is to not let this be swept under the table, to not let this conversation go away. Because no matter whether or not you believe in climate change or you, you see the effects firsthand, if maybe you don't live near a coastal area, haven't experienced the storm, you're not exempt from it. Somebody, somebody that doesn't believe uh, or, or you know really buy into the science isn't exempt from it, and I think keeping up um, media coverage and keeping real information, real facts circulating in the conversation that we all have to have is important to not let this kind of become uh, an issue on the back burner. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, what is true is already true. And I think that owning up to it doesn't make it any worse in that respect. So I think that especially like, since there have been you know, news reports and things that might try to paint it in a, mo a more polarized view, but I think it's really just like a nonpartisan problem and that any sort of division of like, oh, one side supports it, one side doesn't, and then to talk about the politics of that is kind of undermining the actual issues at hand and the fact that we all need to unite together in support and in order to make sure it actually happens. So we've got time for a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll um, mosey downstairs for a reception, and you can ask more questions of the students individually at that point. People have questions? Brad? 
Uh, my name is Brad Hubbard Nelson. I, I'm very enthused to see you guys on stage and <laughs> engaging in what seems to be a, a joyful challenge, uh, which I hope uh, you, you keep on with. One, there's a lot of talk about voting and politics and policy and stuff, which I think is very important. But another challenge that we have, which um, what you should think about, but I, maybe you have some ideas on, is how do we change people's expectations and goals in life? Like we have a lot of people here that are concerned about climate, but we all are under the understanding that we could have as big a house as we want. And our goal in life should be bigger and better. And, and, and maybe we don't need anywhere near as much as we've been taught that we do need. How do we change people's expectations? I think um, the, first, the first kind of step in changing people's expectations is to set an example, to try uh, our best as a generation to live our lives maybe not as materialistic, to, to buy into the, the clean energy, the smaller houses, to find joy in, in intangibles. And to And that really starts with us and spreads through us as well. Hi, I'm Robin Clemens. Um, I'm really excited to find out about Sunrise, and um, it's great the work you guys are doing. I'm very impressed. My question is, I have a couple questions. Um, my question is, you know, there's certain states where oil and gas are produced in large, like Texas, Oklahoma, and then coal, of course, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Are you reaching out to student groups in, you know, well, ideally all 50 states, but in targeted states where they're producing the fossil fuels that are corrupting our environment? And then my second question is, um, are you guys also, you know, they got rid of Scott Pruitt now at the EPA, but now they have an even worse guy that I, Right about in the Boston Globe. So, are you guys also targeting, you know, these high-level people at the EPA that are basically selling um, us down the river, you know, in terms of reauthorizing more fossil fuel production? So that's my two questions. Hi. Um, so I can't specifically answer to targeted outreach relating to hubs, um, but I can say that there are some very thriving hubs in areas um, like. Coal country. There is a very strong hub happening, or a Sunrise Hub in Kentucky um, that is, uh, I know of one of the girls who is part of that is um, from a community that is really being impacted by the um, decline in coal um, and she's seen health effects within her community um, and I think that you really are seeing uh, people rising up to the challenge of joining Sunrise and fighting uh, the climate crisis um, in those communities um, and I can't really speak on behalf of Sunrise relating to the EPA. Gentleman over here. Uh, thank you. I want to um, ask you, this country and like uh, people is very divided. What you experience among your um, fellow students, the young people, is it also very divided? And what you find as a deeper meaning for life? Because you're speaking about the future and the planet. It's like a small village now. We are all world citizens. We know what's happened all over. But as human beings, as young people, do you feel there is a lot of alienation among you? There is no closeness? And do you still believe that so-called American dream, which the whole world bought into and destroyed the planet and still killing each other? and in school shooting happens and all this 
So that's uh, what I came to this country in 1980, just before Reagan was elected president. The same year died a psychoanalyst, Erich Fromm, who had a book to have or to be. And he had said that if we continue living with so many lies, we will end up in technocratic fascism. That's your reality, that fascism is here. And many of your fellows are with those gadgets all the time. You don't see each other's eyes and things. So what life and what future or what planet you are um, dreaming of if you don't know why to live and how to live like deeper heart beings, spirit beings. Thank you. So you asked about like feelings among our fellow students. I would say maybe we're in a bubble, but I don't know any students that don't support climate action. Um, I think there's some that are more involved than others, but I think um, it's a common theme, at least in, at Concord Academy, and I don't know about at the other schools represented here, um, that people believe that climate change is real and people are excited about doing something about it. Um, and then also you asked about um, my feelings on like human life and what it's like. And I personally, one of the reasons that I really um, believe we need to take climate action um, and I believe in the Green New Deal is because I believe that every human life has dignity um, and that every human life is worth fighting for and every human should deserve a livable future. Um, and so I think that um, climate action needs to happen in order for um, every person to be able to experience the future that, um, that I think we need to have. I recently got an opportunity to meet some kids from across the country, and something that was really interesting to me was that a lot of kids weren't in support of climate change. And But one thing that everybody, I feel like, unites all of us is that we're all looking to our future, and we all want a future that's secure for us and that we can live a good life in. And no matter what your beliefs are about what that future should be like, everybody wants a future that's secure for them. So I think the fact that climate change is going to put in jeopardy that future, that unites all of us despite what we specifically believe about climate change or like whether it's real or whether you are Republican or de Democrat. I feel like that unites the common belief in future and protecting our future is going to keep us all together in that kind of common mindset. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to quickly thank you all for coming out and showing your concern. Um, but uh, so I think even uh, what some of these other people's um, questions were kind of addressing is a philosophical and cultural deficit um, that has allowed these kind of poisonous mindsets to kind of just ravage the landscape, um, accumulate massive amounts of wealth while leaving people starve. Um, and I wondered um, if any of you would consider um, the study of like philosophy or rhetoric to kind of put, a, put an end to the root of a lot of these kind of sick mindsets. So a career of choice opportunities. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I've done a lot of reading about sort of rationalist thinking, like an effective altruism and like how you can make the most impact with your time and then what that's worth. So I think that it's definitely important and a lot of people maybe don't think about it as much, but there are a lot of causes out there that, you know, they can really help, you know, decrease human suffering. And so, I don't know, I think we should really focus towards those. I think climate change is one of them that are kind of underserved by what people usually think about. Like, it's not usually in most people's mindsets. And so I think that advocacy for those causes and then more education about those causes and then what is most important about them is really important here. 
Hey, we're going to have uh, just, uh, just one last uh, question, and then people have an opportunity uh, to go downstairs. And we'll ask Audrey after this question to sort of wrap up. So your question, ma'am? Yeah, so uh, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on reparations and how they can be incorporated into the Green New Deal. That's my question. Yeah, um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on reparations and how they can be incorporated into the Green New Deal. I mean, as I think I was talking about before, um, really prioritizing communities that have been historically disenfranchised is one of my favorite um, parts of the Green New Deal. I think it's one of the most important parts. Um, and I think that that type of mindset of really working with people who have been um, historically wronged and not brought along with economies um, and oppressed um, is really important with the Green New Deal. So, Audrey, would you take um, this Yeah, sure. So, um, I do again really just want to thank everybody who is here tonight um, joining in and learning more about the Green New Deal. Um, and I hope that some of you, or most of you, or all of you are feeling like you're ready to do something. Um, the Green New Deal is extremely hopeful. It brings me a lot of hope um, for this future. Um, and if you're curious about ways that you can get more involved, um, I do want to say that there are climate strikes coming up on May 3rd. That's in one week. There are youth climate strikes happening. If you know young people, um, you should engage them, tell them to get involved. Um, we are striking for school because we understand that if we don't have a future to live in, there's no point in receiving my high school diploma. Um, so that is one way you can get involved. Um, and another Sunrise principle I do want to bring about, um, I don't know what number it is, but it's we ask for help and we give what we can. And everybody has something different to contribute th to this movement. It might be time, it may be um, a place for people to gather, and it also may be money. So Sunrise is a movement, um, it's very new, it was founded two years ago, um, and it is definitely, uh, it's very much grassroots funded. Um, and something I really appreciated about Sunrise is they uh, really uh, make an effort not to make um, financial, um, financial situations determine somebody's participation in an action. So for instance, when I went down to DC, I took a bus with a bunch of people, and Sunrise, what Sunrise was prepared to cover the cost of that bus for people who um, did not have the financial means to pay for that themselves. But that money needs to come from somewhere, um, and I really encourage a lot of you, especially if you're over the age of 35, um, which is the, uh, not the age out of Sunrise, but anyway, if you're over the age of 35, I really encourage you to consider making a donation to the movement to really help um, this grassroots organization keep going. Um, I believe there are donation bins around. You can also come talk to me about how to write a check, who to address that to, um, and who to put on the name. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all so much for your time.